Hi, it's Alan Edelman and Philip the Corgi. And today's lecture is going to be about equilibrium and Poisson equation. And I'm not gonna assume that you know any physics at all. You might've seen a little bit, maybe none at all, that's fine. Uh, but first, let me give a kind of preview to next week's lecture. Next week, we're very lucky, a week from today, on Tuesday, November 3rd, I guess that's election day in the United States. Uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, John Urschel, who some of you may know the name. Uh, he's a graduate student, kind of finishing up right now. He's a PhD student in the mathematics department at MIT. He's a great mathematician. And he also uh, was a professional football player, now retired from the Baltimore Ravens. Um, and he's going to give next week's lecture. And this, this uh, lecture on my lecture today on Poisson's equation is kind of a necessary background material. So I hope you'll follow along so you'll be able to uh, follow along John's uh, lecture next week. So this lecture is going to be about equilibrium. I found this movie I hadn't heard about before. I don't know anything about it. Uh, I don't know if it's any good or not, but at least I wanted to focus on the word equilibrium because uh, this is kind of the first step to understanding and not be afraid of Poisson's equation. So in this lecture, I'm gonna start with this discrete and then go continuous. So equilibrium can apply to galaxies under gravity. Uh, it could be the, uh, the temperature of the earth could be, you know, the heat around the earth, the heat distribution around the earth could be under equilibrium. Uh, the charged particles around the conductor can be in equilibrium. So uh, uh, of course, in the real world, um, these things are always, uh, under motion, the Earth's temperature, as we know, thanks to climate change, is always rising. Um, so in the real world, things are not always in equilibrium, but sometimes equilibrium is, is, is a good approximation for some small period of time. And so these ideas apply. So to get at the equations of the sort that we're going to want to solve, uh, I'm not going to go right into PDs or anything. I'm going to imagine that I have a bag in my hand of uh, one ohm resistors. You can actually buy, I looked at Amazon, I can get 100 one ohm resistors for uh, about 650, right? So it's about six and a half cents each for one of these little gadgets. So uh, a resistor is something you'd put in a circuit and uh, it, it's just like it sounds, it resists the flow of electricity. And uh, these, these are exactly what they look like. These little bands, these colored bands are color coded to tell you stuff like how much resistance it has, I think. Uh, but in any event, you know, I could have a bag of these one ohm resistors. I have a feeling 649 is even a high price to pay, but if I wanted it tomorrow, I, I could in principle have it. So again, I'm not assuming that you even know Ohm's law. If you do, uh, just listen quickly. But um, if you have one of these one ohm resistors, you could place it in the circuit, just like I show here. You just uh, hook up a, you know, an ordinary nine volt battery. I guess I've got one in my drawer. I could pull one out. You know, an ordinary one volt battery that everybody's familiar with, there's a battery, right? And then you connect up some wires and uh, hook it up to the resistor and you can measure stuff like um, the voltage, the, it's a nine volt battery. And so if you set your volt meter to volts, uh, you know, these are DC volts. If you measure it, you, you know, should see nine volts approximately uh, when you attach your meter. Uh, then there's current, which is the flow of electricity through the wires which you can also measure if you set your little multimeter to amps, it would come up as nine amps, right? And then resistance itself can be measured um, across the resistor. And since there's a battery inside of these multimeters, you don't even need it in a circuit and you get a, a you can find out this is the one ohm resistance. So you see, I'm using Ohm's law. Basically it's saying that the drop in voltage, uh, the difference in voltage from here to here is gonna be the current times the resistance. I chose one ohm so that I could do the math real easy. The voltage drop of nine volts is gonna be nine amps times one ohm. So nine equals nine is the basic equation. Well, you see now, once I've got this bag of resistors, what I can do is start arranging them in fun patterns, right? And so here I show a pattern where I arrange them in a plus sign, okay? So I just kind of put them all um, in this nice little plus sign pattern. I'm gonna combine the four resistors and assume one way or another, I can arrange the, the five important voltages, the four at the end and the one in the middle to be whatever I want them to be, right? And I'll just label them with the variables, you know, the, the, the north voltage, the east voltage, southwest and 
my own voltage, I'll just label V. And if you do that, current will start to flow and the current has to flow somewhere. So if you attach a, if, if you attach a wire, the current can flow, you can measure it. And we can ask ourselves, what is this output current? And the answer, I already told you on the last slide how to do it, so you already know what to do. You simply, because these are one ohm resistance resistors, it's just a change in voltage, right? Uh, you just add them all up and you'll get the current, right? So the, the north change in voltage, the east, the south, and the west, which you could put all together and say, it's the sum of all my neighboring voltages minus four times myself. So that would be the output current. So now that you understand this basic equation, which we can use over and over again in the rest of this little lecture, uh, let's make a bigger pattern. For example, let's connect up uh, a whole lot of resistors in such a way that there's 60 nodes, okay? So if you, the nodes are the black dots, right? And so let's imagine that I, I've got 60 nodes, right? I've got a, a, you know, I don't know, there's like nine resistors across times uh, six is 54. And then, uh, you know, there, there, there's five resistors down here times five. Is another. So there's lots and lots of resistors. Um, but there are 60 nodes. You could count those 10 columns and six rows. So there are 60 nodes. Um, and if you had a circuit situation where you knew the output current at each node, then you could in principle solve for all of the voltages. And uh, in a future video, I'm gonna show you how, but before I do that, let's, let's set up like a very specific example. Let's take our little pattern here and literally let's connect the battery to the top right and the top left with a wire. Okay, so if you did connect the battery, then current would start flowing through this mesh, right? And you can measure it. There would be, um, plus I would be the amount of amps that would sort of come in, it would flow through this mesh somehow, and the I would come out. So if you wanna measure output current, there's I coming out here, and uh, the convention is this would be minus I coming out because if it's plus I going in, we say it's minus I coming out. Right, so there's minus I coming out here, plus I coming out here. And that, like I said, you can measure. Once you have that measurement, if you want the voltage at every one of these nodes, well, you can measure it with your little voltmeter thing that like I showed you before. But the fun thing is, is that you now have all the information to calculate it using a computer or using it mathematically. And so uh, first of all, let's show you how you do it. The first thing you would do is you would set up the equations. So these would be, there are 60 black dots. So you could give each one a variable name of some kind, you know, V1 through V60. I'm not doing it here because it just seems cumbersome, but there's 60 variables. And I'm just gonna kind of think of it one, one equation at a time. In each case, you have our favorite equation now, the sum of my neighboring voltages minus four times myself will be, well, it'll be minus I in the upper right and plus I in the upper left for the output current. Everywhere else, there's no output current. So in all the other 58 spots, the, the equation would be zero. And just a small point, just to sort of make it all consistent, you could add some more one ohm resistors at the boundary and ground the boundary or something just to, to make this all work out. And then, then all these sort of boundary voltages could just be labeled as zero and it would all work out somehow. Okay, so there are other things people can do with the boundary, but you get the idea. So you see, I've got 60 equations and 60 unknowns. Um, and each, of, each one of my 60 equations uh, involves five of the nodes, right? It's, it's my node here, whichever, you know, whichever one I'm focusing on. For example, if I was focusing on this node, it would involve these five variables. These would be the ones that I would be focusing on. And I would say that this linear combination, you know, the, the sum of the four neighbors minus four times myself would be, for this node, it would be zero. Okay, um, for the boundary, uh, for, the, for the upper right boundary, the upper left corner boundary, uh, we would use the minus i and the plus i. And as I said, in an upcoming video, I'm gonna show you, you see, some people would think that you need linear algebra to solve 60 equations and 60 unknowns. And linear algebra is not a bad way to think about this problem. And you could set this up with, with matrices and linear algebra. And you know, in Julia, you could use a backslash and you could solve the equations. But there are methods that, really precede modern linear algebra. The famous mathematician Jacobi knew how to solve these problems practically by pen and paper. Um, I could think it would get a little clunky on pen and paper, but you could, I could show you how you would do it. Okay, so, all right, here we go. We had a grid of resistors problem. I showed you how to set up. I'm not yet showing you how to solve it, but rather what I'd like to do is 
turn to um, a kind of functional form of the same problem, if you will. So if I may, what I'd like to do is consider, so I want to imagine I have like a big piece of graph paper and, uh, and I have a function defined at every point ultimately in the plane, but I'll, right now it just needs to be at the grid points, um, a function of x and y, like x cubed minus y to the fourth. Okay, something like that. It, it doesn't really matter what but something like x cubed minus y to the fourth, okay? And so if I'm only evaluating at the integer grid points, and so let's just kind of do it at the origin, then I've got the, sa the same sort of plus sign setup that I had with my gridded resistors. Okay, so um, I'm imagining that I've got this, I've got, I'm at the origin just to focus, and I've got my north, south, east, and west neighbors. And of course, if I took this example function over here, what I can do is evaluate this function just to kind of get our feet wet. So what I would like to do is take, for example, at the origin, this is zero, clearly zero. Um, at my east neighbor here at one zero, this is two times one cubed, that's two minus zero, right? Or on the other side, it's two times minus one cubed, that's minus two minus zero. Uh, or the north neighbor here, um, x is zero, so that's zero minus one, you see, okay? or uh, if I had y is minus one and zero minus or minus one to the fourth, which again is minus one. Okay, so these are the values of my function. Okay, but I'm interested, I don't really care about this particular function. I'm gonna do it in general. So I'll go back to putting the variables like I had over here, but now I'm gonna try start taking first differences. Now, first differences vertically are always above minus below. The corresponding thing horizontally is gonna be the right minus the middle. So. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll take fn minus f because fn is below f and we'll take f minus fs since f is above, since fs is below f or f is above fs. Similarly, we're going to take fe minus f because e is to the right and f minus fw because it's to the right. And so these are my four first differences. Now to get a second difference, what I have to do is I have to take this minus this. Okay, so if I take this one minus this one, I hope you can see that this is the result vertically and this is the result here horizontally, okay? And if I add the two second differences, I will get this result and I hope this looks familiar. Now, you might be wondering, your graph paper here has a step size of one here, right? You, you're at the integer point, but this function makes sense everywhere and if you really were approximating differences, you kind of think you might want to be closer by, right? Maybe one feels a little too far, right? When you do calculus, you, you know, you take derivatives, you take your, 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 your function value nearby minus yourself and you divide by the, the distance. So how would that work out? What happens if you want to take steps that are smaller than one? Well, you can actually take any step size. Let's just assume that it's H in the, in the vertical and horizontal direction that could be generalized, but um, imagine, you know, what we're doing is, you know, we, we make a step to the east and a step to the west, um, and in the y direction, that's the north, and in the y direction, there is the south, okay? And so this would be the second difference. And of course, if you are trying to approximate derivatives, uh, the first derivative would divide by h, and then when you do it again, you divide by another h, and so the right normalization is to divide by h squared, right? So this kind of does uh, second derivatives very well, and so now, if you let me put this all together, let me kind of do it in a notation, maybe that will impress your friends. Uh, here's sort of the symbols that are kind of uh, written in out. So this mathematical symbol, the symbol itself is pronounced nabla. Uh, nabla is a Greek word or an ancient Greek word, I think for, for harp, I guess uh, Greek harps look like triangles or something, I'm not sure. But this is the Greek symbol nabla. Uh, and uh, this, this is the symbol for partial. And here you could read this if you like though, that we don't say nabla squared though, we're gonna say Laplacian of F in honor of the famous mathematician Laplace. So you read this as the Laplacian of F and this is the sum of, this is really the, the, the continuous version of the second difference in X. You could pronounce it as the second partial of F with respect to X. Um, or you could pronounce it as partial f, or partial squared f, partial x squared. I would say the second partial of f with respect to x, um, plus the second partial of f with respect to y. And so what the symbol nabla means is it just 
when applied to a function f, it literally means just this, okay? And But you now know that this is just an approximation to uh, this, this sum of my neighbors minus four times myself divided by h squared. And in fact, if you're a, a pure mathematician, you would say that under the right circumstances, when h goes to zero, it tends to this derivative thing. But if you're a computational scientist, like we are going to be in this class and doing computational thinking, these are the equations that we might imagine solving. There are other ways to solve the problem, but for today, we're going to imagine you set up the problem by solving these equations in as many unknowns. And just to set the stage now, uh, this is my last slide. If you're a, a mathematician, you would specify Poisson's equation in the following way. You'd say, oh, I'd like to solve Laplacian of f equals g on some region, let's say in the plane, which has a boundary. There's a the boundary. Um, and we assume that g is known on R, right? So g is, of course, a function of x and y, and that's given to you. Uh, and uh, f is known only on the boundary originally. But what we'd like to do, solving the equation means finding f of x, y everywhere in R. So at the beginning of the problem, you know f only at the boundary. And what it means to solve the problem is to find it everywhere in the region R. But since we're thinking about computational thinking, um, and I think it's a lot more straightforward to think of it discreetly. What you could do is imagine you put a graph paper on region R, and I started to draw something here that I hope looks like you know nodes. You could take step sizes of H, whatever you like. And uh, the nodes, I started to draw them in black over here. They, they represent the unknown variables, the unknown F values, right? So every node is going to be the unknown F at the beginning of the problem. So we assume that G is known at every node when we begin. And f is known just at the boundary. Okay, you have to deal with the boundary in, in interesting ways, but let's not worry about that. Um, but basically, we have for every interior node, we're going to have one equation that looks like this. And let's be very, very clear the unknowns in each equation are these five f values. Okay, the g is known. And of course, h of the step side is known. And actually, you may know some of these five if you're hitting the boundary. But if you're completely on the interior away from the boundary, then these five are unknown. But the point is you have one equation for every one of these nodes. And so you'll be able to solve it. Okay. And in an upcoming video, I'm going to show you how you can solve this practically with pen and paper, though you'd probably be better off using a computer. <laughs>